we're going to be talking about how to automate your content workflow, how to save time, how to do more with less so that ultimately you can grow your business, grow your organic traffic with some of the automations. And we've got some good stuff at the end. So make sure to stick around. Uh, Tommy's got some goodies for us. So we're going to dive right in without further ado. Tommy, please take it away. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so thank you everybody for showing up. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you coming on. I'm really excited about the workflow automation stuff. Um, I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, just give you a little bit about me. I was the, let's see, I was the founder of the content studio. I am the founder of the content studio. I was the original editor over at CXL. I was the first marketing hire at Shopify Plus and the global editor in chief at QuickBooks. And what the through line here is with each one of these different companies that I worked at, starting with CXL, uh, there was a workflow issue that started to happen as each one of these sites became more popular. So with CXL, we were getting a lot of guest blog requests. Um, and as the editor and the only person really doing social media and you know running the blog at the time, it started to become a little overwhelming. So I had to create some, some automations and some workflow uh, hacks to make it so I could keep on top of everything. Shopify Plus, I was the first marketing hire over there and employee number 14. By the time I left, there were 150 employees or 200 employees and we reached our first 1500 customers. With that hyper growth that had happened, I was there for two years. Um, we had seen our customer service team expand. We had seen everything expand. Um, and with that being the only marketing person running the blog, the most frequent publishing arm of the company at the time, uh, we had to keep on top of all of these different requests coming in from customer service managers and product marketers and uh, literally the entire company. So having to keep on top of that made it so I had to have really tight systems in place to manage all of the stuff coming in from all different places. And then as the global editor in chief at QuickBooks, I had started with a team of five to 10 uh, freelance content writers and we scaled that. I, I was in the American market to begin with and then moved over to the global market where I had scaled content across 16 different markets and had uh, a lot of the customer facing channels. So social, email, SEO, all in the same place, having visibility into each other's work and allowing the workflow process to have a completely coordinated approach. So we were getting rid of things like co content cannibalization. We knew what was on each other's calendars, big challenges that come with very large organizations. Uh, so this really represents the workflow optimization and automation side of things uh, of my career really is representative of working within scaling these content programs and, and letting them work uh, for you as, as much as possible and keep everybody sane in the process. Um, so as a content marketer, right, I've been in this space for a very long time now. I've been doing this for 16 years at the moment. The ideal situation that every single content marketer wants to do is the big integrated multi-channel approach. We want to have the podcast with the, that ties to the YouTube channel, that ties to the, uh, to the blog post, that ties to the social media responses. We want all of these things and we want them coordinated all at once. But as you can see on the slide here, we only have so much bandwidth um, and we still try to do everything, right? So there is a research study that came out by Airtable earlier this year that said compared to a year ago, uh, the volume of campaign requests has changed dramatically, right? It's increased 80% of content marketers, 80% of marketers say that demand on their team has increased substantially uh, from 2020 to 2021. And it's been a major source of stress for everybody. And if you look at what these major stressors are, right, you can start to see things like uh, operational complexity, um, challenges of collaborating with stakeholders, gaps in current tools, inefficient workflows. And these are challenges that are happening across the board on companies of all sizes. And when we start to dig into this a little bit more, um, what happens when these, uh, these, these programs and these challenges come into play is it creates this high level of organizational drag that makes it so it's very difficult to get something out the door. You're waiting for legal approvals. You're waiting for your editor to get on top of stuff. You're waiting for everybody else. You're, you might miss an email or a Slack message. And 
what happens is it takes a lot of time to ship something probably more than necessary and especially in larger organizations that can lead to projects getting dropped it can lead to um, things getting shipped late or missing ideal windows of time and as you can see here it makes a lot of people frustrated that a lot of this creative energy that they're putting into the process um, doesn't end up coming to fruition at all if a campaign doesn't ship that's not ideal and a lot of this energy that you've put into this uh, goes out the window um so if we look at this a little bit further if we look at uh on average again this is the Airtable data uh, what percentage of the work are you spending on manual operational tasks right uh a lot of people will go all the way up to you know the majority goes up to 50 percent of their time working on manual tasks right and this can mean anything from double entry to sending out the same email over and over again um, to asking for those requests and trying to get on top of these from other people and i'd actually be curious um leave in the chat right i'm going to keep talking but leave in the chat how much of your time do you feel like you're doing redundant things on a weekly basis right very very curious to know that um it's always an interesting thing to to see how much of that happens there's another study that came out that was by a company called smart sheets um an airtable competitor actually and they found that in 60 percent of occupations one third of tasks can be fully automated um, and it's something that a lot of people aren't doing right and something else that was very interesting about some of this research that's come out is 60% of marketers report using 20 plus tools and more than half of their process is syncing data across these tools somewhat or completely manually. And when I read that, right, when I saw that for the first time, I said, there's no way that I'm using 20 tools. Zach, I know when we talked about this originally, um, it, it's one of those really hard to believe. Jump in on this. It's really hard to believe that you're using 20 plus tools, right? Yeah, absolutely. You don't realize how many you actually have in your tech stack until you list them out and you go, wow, you know, how are we actually managing all of this? And I think a lot of people can relate with that. Yeah. Yeah. When I went to quantify this, I, I read that and was like, there's no way. And then I took a, a inventory of the tools I use on a regular basis. And we can see, you know, Google Docs, Airtable, Keep, Ahrefs, Sheets, Slides, right? Um, these are all the things that I'm personally using. And then when I'm working with other people, I'm also responsible for knowing all of these different tools, right? Because for somebody, for every person who uses Google Docs, there's, you know, uh, another person who likes to use Word or people like to use Asana or Trello or Jira. And if you're keeping track of all of those, you have to be fluent in 53 different tools in my case um, and syncing information across both of those. And it becomes very, very challenging, very, very difficult. And when we look at this, when we go back to the data and we ask people how manual or automated is your process for uh, synchronizing data across these tools, you can see the majority of people are still saying there's a lot of manual process that's happening. Now, fortunately, we do see uh, just over a third of people are saying that it's mostly automated, which is great. But still, this is a lot of time that's being spent just syncing data across multiple tools. Um, and I, I don't have the slide here, unfortunately, or, but when you start to quantify this a little bit more, the time that it can take for somebody to do all of this manual syncing over the course of the week is the range goes anywhere between eight to 20 hours per week, spending time just doing manual syncing, double entry, uh, stuff like that. I want to work in uh, Airtable. Somebody else works in Asana, right? So I put the same thing there. I'm doing something in one tool. I have to bring it over to another, right? Big challenge. I can't tell you how many times I've had to put information in two places, especially with like Jira boards when I'm working with developers. It's awful. Um, so I'm going to walk through a common scenario here, right? This is one that a lot of marketers, uh, content marketers, but also anyone in the SEO space can uh, really relate to, I think, is, okay, so we're going to do, we're going to create a blog post, right? And we're going to do some keyword research in a single tool, and then we're going to manually export that keyword research into a Google Sheet. 
And then we're going to copy and paste. We're going to create a SEO outline template in Google Docs. Then we're going to put the keyword information in there. We're going to write the outline. We'll then email an author who will then send us the, they'll create the content and then they'll send it for us to review. We'll copy the draft from Google Doc into WordPress. We'll then clean the code up. We'll insert the image. We'll schedule the content and then finally we'll publish. So we've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 steps in that process. Now, this is where the automation starts coming into play, right? I'm going to do some, I'm going to share my screen live now. Okay. Can you still see my screen? Zach, can you see yep. my screen? Yep, we got you. Okay, cool. Cool. And just going over to the chat for a second. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, 20, 20 plus tabs as usual. Zach says that there. Um, first thing he does, yeah. Log into all of the tools each day. That's what Corinthia says. Log into all the tools. Totally relatable. Um, so one of the things that I've done, right? And here's an example base that I use. But one of the things that I do with my keyword research list, and I'm using Airtable. Uh, I use Airtable as my base of operations for pretty much all of my content marketing. I want to keep everything in one place as much as possible so I don't have to deal with... Um, deal with logging into multiple tools and I want to have a home base. So if I'm doing keyword research, for example, I might do a competitive poll. That's what this is right here. I did a competitive poll on Ahrefs and then put that in here. This is the manual part of the process. I'll put all of that information in here, right? But because Airtable has this wonderful linked records uh, ability, right? I've hidden the field. Um, because there is the linked records ability, I can then from here create a new content record that is my, my workflow, right? It goes into my workflow. So we're gonna say this piece is, you know, what is the best CFD creative platform, right? And now I'll put this uh, into an idea phase in my status. Uh, and then there are a number of other things that I'll put in here, but I have the search volume and all of this, right? Stop me, Zach, if uh, any of this starts to go a little too fast because I get really excited about this stuff. You're good. Let's keep rocking. And I want to encourage folks to drop questions into the chat. We will have Q&A section again at the end, but feel free to interrupt and we can clarify anything. Take it away, Tommy. Excellent. So in the normal process, what we were talking about before is that we have a, a keyword list in a Google Drive. And then we have to send that over to an author potentially to create, or we create an outline uh, and have all of that kind of, you know, all taking place in multiple tools in multiple places. Now, if I'm working with my SEO team, the SEO team can put all of the information here. And then what I just did was put a content record. I created a content record from here, <clears throat> which goes over to where I manage all of my workflow stuff out of here. So what we see here, that big old keyword list, right? That CDF trading platform, we created the record here. Now it ends up here. And now I can move into my day-to-day -day workflow. So, um, so once I validated this idea, I can say, okay, this is validated. Uh, I have another automation that's set up where uh, and it's not triggering right now, but where the draft will automatically create itself in Google Docs. So I will now own the document. I'll walk through how to create that one in just uh, a little bit later. So I'll own the document, which is something that a lot of, if you're working with freelance authors, a lot of freelance authors will create the document on their side and then share it with you. You don't own that document. You're essentially renting it if you pay for it. This gives me the ability to uh, have all of that in my domain, in my expert, like in my area. Um, and then we can kind of go through the uh, process where uh, we start to create everything. So now we've got this piece. Oh no, of course, because we're live, it's not gonna, I've got things that are broken, of course. Um, status, and it says validated that condition. There we go. This is why I like Airtable, by the way because I can just create a status here. Nope, of course not. Oh, wait. Sorry, Zach. 
All good, Tommy. We, we do have a question in the chat just to clarify. Is there an option to download a CSV file? In Airtable? Yes. I think Corinthia is referring to, yeah, downloading a CSV from Airtable to get it in that format. Yep. So it's, it's definitely, uh, the ability is definitely in there. Uh, I don't recall how to do it right now, but it is uh, absolutely an option. So let me see if I can find it. Nope, I'm not gonna be able to, but you can definitely uh, easily export it. How long did it take me to roughly set up this automation? I'll show you how long it takes for most of this stuff to be set up. For me anyways, I've been doing this for a very long time, but um, this particular thing, this is actually something that's right out of the box on Airtable. So uh, what we have here, uh, they have several options when you create a new field. Um, and one of the options that they have here is linked to another record. So one of the other things, what will happen is you create this field and then it will ask you which uh, table, which one of these tables over here, do you want to link to? And then you can connect these cells to other cells um, within, within there. So I'll give you another example in just a second here. Um, and a question for me, Tommy. So I believe if folks stick around at the end, you're going to be giving away some of the actual Zapier zaps so that it's, it's more or less just point and click and folks can, can copy some of these automations that you've built. Yeah. Um, in, so with this particular base, I will share an example of this base. And then there will be other zaps that aren't this specifically, but um, that will show you how to do a few other things that I'm going to demonstrate in here as well. Great. Cool. Um, so what we have uh, there, we've been able to link that record. That's just something that Airtable does right out of the box. And then what we have here, and you saw me kind of create this before, um, the way Airtable is structured, which is what I love, is that you can create individual views for all of the content that you would normally have in a, in a regular um, table here. So if I wanted to take create a view, right? Gotta try to remember to slow myself down at times. Oh, there we go, download CSV. Uh, if I wanted to create a view, I could duplicate this view and we'll call this uh, test view. Uh, okay. This allows me, by the way, so what I'm trying to do here is take all of the raw information that I would normally have from a content calendar and break it down into the individual statuses of what, uh, of my problem, of my primary workflow. So, um, so we'll add the condition where the status is over here, idea. And now we have only the things that have the status idea. And that's actually going to be the same thing that we see here. Stop me at any point. But you can see there, Ben, like right there should give you an idea of how long that took to create this particular view and to break this down um, by, the, by the steps in the process. And if I take a step back for a second, that's actually what I, when I, when I look at creating a piece of anything, I'm trying to break down those individual steps of that creation process. So for example, here, uh, to create a piece of content, uh, we have to go through the ideas phase, we'll validate it, we'll put it into production. Uh, once something is produced, it'll be for review, we'll create second drafts, upload, schedule, and publish, right? That's the life cycle of a piece of content in this particular instance. I break it down that way so I can keep track very easily of where anything is at, right? And even if we don't take things from the idea phase, uh, if, if, if nothing, if we're capturing all of our ideas, but we don't, if we're capturing all of our ideas, but we don't actually use all of these, that's fine because it's something that we can come back to later. But once I validated something, um, I know that it's something that's worth putting into production. With me so far? Question on my end, Tommy. What is what does validation entail specifically? How do you move sure. from an idea to the point where you're actually going to produce it? Sure. So that is either if there is. So I try to think of this in two ways, right? Either uh, I'm the person who's coming up with ideas, and then we'll validate it through keyword research. So we come up with the idea first, and then look at if there's a search volume um, or, or anything around. Like, is there something that's searchable here? Or I'm validating ideas by looking at things like 
Um, is there social uh, social buzz around any of this stuff? So I might use uh, the Ahrefs um, social uh, tool, or I'll look at BuzzSumo to see if there's any sort of sharing that's being happened around that. I might also take a look at a Twitter uh, search and find out if there's any kind of interest in people sharing this type of content uh, out there. Got it. So you might validate something as a like a top of funnel social driven piece or as a, a more search driven piece based on on search volume and, and keyword data from Ahrefs. Right. Exactly. Because if there's nothing if there's nothing there to like if there's no interest in a particular subject, then why write about it? Right. And a lot of times as an author and as an editor, we come up with these ideas thinking that they're going to be awesome, but then there's nothing to sort of indicate that it's something that we should that people actually care about. Now, from an, putting on my editor hat for a second, if there's a concept that's kind of brand new, right, then we can validate by going, okay, there's, there's conversation that's happening around this, but nobody's really identified specifically what these issues are. So how can we talk, how can we find that type of validation and then uh, find ways that we can sort of distribute to that, you know, emailing people afterwards and saying, hey, I noticed that we have this challenge over here. We've tried to solve this. Let's get it out into the, you know, here's a piece that we've created on that. Makes sense. Uh, we have a question from April. She asks, so do you use Airtable primarily for project management, automating workflows or both? Both, both. So, so I'm kind of gonna be bouncing back and forth, I think between the two of these, um, but this is the workflow management aspect by breaking it down into these individual steps. But Airtable, from what I found, is one of the most automation-friendly platforms, which, um, which I'm going to build an automation live uh, in just a little bit here to, to kind of show you how that all works. Um, OK, so what we're finding here is we'll go through the different steps. And one of the automations that starts to come into play, right? I'll put something into production, and I have an automation that's set up where we'll email an author uh, when that uh, when that piece is ready for them to create. So I'll move this status from idea to uh, in production, right? And what I'll do along the way is is I have this writer field over here, and see if I can find it. Where to go? Writer, writer. There we go. So I'm gonna say like, okay, uh, what is the best C the CFD trading platform? Okay, so I'm gonna look at my writers and again, we've got another linked record field over here, right? Uh, where I can assign the appropriate writer to this piece. Now, if I do this, right, looking at these linked records again, we've got this writer, it links to the author's table, right? And the author's table over here is where I'm managing all of my authors. And where I can see here is we've got the first name, the last name of the author, and then their contact information. Now, what's happening when I add this author to this record is they the information, their email, for example, uh, of course, I'm not gonna be able to find it, but there, the automation is set up where if I assign Kai here, it's going to then email Kai, because I have the email, to let him know that the automation, um, or to let them know that the, uh, the, the piece is now in production, it's ready for them to take a look at, right? So this is where that, April, this is where that workflow management side and the automation side start to come into play, where uh, that's now one step that I no longer have to do manually. I no longer have to say, uh, send the email every single time, hey, this piece is ready for you to write. Now I can just have it, have it done, right? Now it's just being done for me because I've added them to that step. Um, one of the other things that uh, I, I do in this particular part of the process is uh, I'll, I have an automation that will automatically create a new record, um, or when I create a new record, it will also create a new document, and it will add all of that information. I can then add them directly to the document, and it will update the table, uh, update the um, the table here. So 
what I'm going to do is I'll actually trigger this. I'll walk through the step. I'll walk through this. Okay, so when I'm working with influencers and my email back to them needs to be customized based on uh, the content we are sending back and forth. While the deadlines are set, the message of the emails being sent uh, will need to be customized. Does Airtable allow a cross like that process like this to work? Yes. Um, there is, and I, I do this with uh, my notes, for example, there's a whole automation that I have in play where, uh, where when I have the automation note or when I have the notes, uh, let's see, see if it's in here. It's not, I'm doing this with, this particular base does not have some of this stuff, but so I do apologize, Zach, because this is not, uh, this is not ideal. Um, well, I think it's just important for, for folks to understand what is possible. And it sounds like you, you can customize yeah. those emails, right? Yeah. What, what happens is I've got this whole automation that's set up that where I, when I have assigned an author to a specific uh, piece, what will then happen is not only will it email that author with the piece being ready to go uh, based on what I have, based on what we have in the author's table, but the automation also sends a digest of a lot of the other uh, pieces that we're going to need out of it. So if I have a note section in there, um, or I, if I write in my notes, right, see if I have this. Okay, so when I write my notes on the piece, where is it? When I write the notes on the piece, I'll write whatever I need to have in here that we need to expect out of this particular piece. And then that's sent to the author as well. And any of the information that we want um, for that author to have or for the influencer to have in your case, uh, that will all be there. Anything that's in this record, we can basically customize when we send that to the, the, the person that we're working with. Um, and they can see only what they need and not anything more than that. Does that make sense, April? Yes, cool. Um, so, so we try to customize these uh, to, to make it so that's exactly what I kind of want to go with there is that anytime we want people to see only the things that they need to see and when they need to see it. Um, that's one of the big challenges with like email chains and uh, things like that, where we don't necessarily need all of the information. And if we can automate a lot of this stuff, we can, uh, we can then see, you know, we, we, don't need more than we need, or we're not giving more than we need. And we're not asking people to participate in parts of the process where they might disengage uh, because they're just not needed there. So how do you automate permissions with Google Docs? You may get into this later. I actually wanna get into that right now. Okay, so when we're in the Zap, so the two that I use only a handful of tools, really. Um, I use Airtable as my database. I'll use Zapier as a lot of the connection, uh, a lot of the automation side of things. And then I'll use Typeform um, for other, like for content intake. And I'll use uh, ConvertKit for my email list. A lot of the principles that I'm going to show here, even though I use these tools, um, a lot of this can still apply to other tools. This is just conceptual at the moment and what uh, sort of happens here. So what we're looking at here is we're going to create in this particular automation, we're going to create, um, a new draft, right? We're going to, we're going to automatically add this draft to this record. So we can then see, we then have everything that we need within a draft. Okay. This is going to take out that part of the process where, uh, we would ask our author to send us a draft. We would, or we send them a draft. It's just going to automatically be created. So first step in this process is we would tell Airtable uh, or we would tell Zapier to create a new record in Airtable. So we go Airtable, the uh, event trigger is new record, All right? We'll then choose our account as our Airtable account. We'd have connected in any part in the process and then we'll set up the trigger. Now, what we're looking at here is we're telling it to look at this specific base, right, over here. And when we click into that, this specific table, the all publishing properties table, and then this specific view, when something enters this view, 
So what we're going to look at in this case is the, uh, I'm going to look at the validated view. Okay. Validated. Okay. And you can see here, like all of the different uh, parts of this Airtable base are now found inside uh, Zapier. Zapier's identified all of those. So what we'll do here is then test this. We're going to load and find the record that we just created. In this case, it's going to be what is the best CDF trading platform, right? That's this. We've created this record. Now it's going to show up here. And then two things that we're going to do is we're going to create a folder in Google Drive, right? And the reason I want to create this folder is so I can keep all of my information organized very quickly. So we'll tell Zapier, we're going to choose the app Google Drive. The action event, we've got several, but we're going to create a folder, okay? We'll choose the account. That one's going to be Tommy is my name. Let me just pull this open here for you. Um, See all my different email addresses, folks. Okay, we'll go over here and we're gonna set up the action. The action will be to use the drive. The parent folder is going to be this blog post or this blog post folder right here. I'll clear this out. See, I've already run this. Trash. So when a new record is created in Airtable, we're going to create a folder in Google Drive, and that folder name is going to be what the Airtable record is uh, called, right? We're gonna test this action. And what's gonna happen is boom, we can see a new folder was created, okay? This is where it starts to become a little magical. Now we're gonna open up this folder because the next step in the process is to be, uh, to create a, text document inside there. And what I love about this, right, you can do, so the app is going to be the Google Docs, the action event is going to be create document from text. What I love about this is that we can also start to customize what's gonna show up in that Google document. So if you're the type of person who uh, has, you know, slugs, title tags, meta description, you want this type of information from your author every single time, you can start to add the, you can add this information here. And now every single document that's created will have this information every single time. You no longer have to copy a document that has the same thing. You know, you no longer have to add it every single time manually. This is all being done. And what we're looking at here is the folder ID, right? Which is the URL that's up here. We're gonna have that same folder ID. We're gonna test the action. work. Okay. And then you can see over here, the document's been created automatically. Okay. So now we go into the document. This has everything that we need. And then the permissions part comes in next, where we'll add the file sharing permissions in the Google Drive. Now, uh, right now I have this set to anybody with a link can, uh, can edit, but this can be customized to pull in the information, pull in that email address that we found over here in the authors table, right? We can pull that information in uh, and, and set it to be the person who has, we can, we can basically set it to be that one person if we don't wanna have it to be open for everybody, okay? So we're gonna say Google Drive again, add file sharing preference, and then uh, we'll choose the account, the account's the same, we'll set up the action. So the drive, right, it's the same drive, the file ID is what we found in step three, right? Which is this document, right? We can just double check to make sure that everything's the same here. And then we can set the sharing preference right here. So anyone with the link can edit, anyone with the, or within your org um, can comment, anybody on the internet. Uh, and then you can really just drive and drill into the specific stuff. We'd add another step um, if, it, if we want the one specific person, but basically, this is where you, uh, you would do that, right? So we'll test the action, right? As we go over here, we can see that this is locked and now the sharing preference has been uh, changed. So now anyone on the internet with this link can edit. This is like, I love this one, that sharing preference. Yeah, flex. Um, I love this sharing preference part 
being automated specifically because there are so many times where I try to click into an author's document and I'm like, ah, can you allow me to be in this thing, please? Like, raise your hand if, uh, if that's happened to you before. We're like, can I just, I want to get to this faster, but I can't. This is one of those organizational drag things that I love that this automation specifically can solve, right? And then the last thing is that we, the last step in this process is we go back to Airtable and we update the record. We'll choose the account, it's the same Airtable account, and then we'll set up the action. Again, we're on the same, the same base, the same table. We're looking at the record ID, which is this one specific record that we were looking at before, right? We get that information in the URL when we open up the record. This is your record ID up here, at the very top. We make sure that we have that record ID uh, and we can pull any of this information from here as well. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll scroll, I've got a lot of fields here, but what we scroll down here is to the draft URL and then we'll pull from here, create document from here, and then we'll find this alternate link, right? Which is the link that shows us, that's the link to the document itself. Now, this is where some magic happens. I'm going to scroll down right here. I'm going to remove this just so you can see what happens. All right. So now there's no draft URL. And now we've got the alternate link. That's all set in there. And really with this part of the process, by the way, if you wanted to have any other um, things added to this, you have an opportunity to do that here as well. So say um, you wanted to add a, a collaborator every single time. Uh, this particular document goes into play um, or this particular record is ready to go. You can add the same person every single time like clockwork. So we'll go through, we'll test this action, right? Again, there's nothing here. Test the action. And now we have the same document, right? Now we can go back to that document that was there before. That's a lot of steps. Right, that looks like a lot of steps when we walk through it this way. But what it really means is that when we create a record here, this will attach itself over here. There's a bit of a delay. So it's gonna take like with my Zapier account, it's gonna take a little bit for it to happen. Um, but ultimately anytime we create a record here, this draft URL is gonna attach itself and the author can be notified right away. So we've created a closed loop system there that saves us a lot of time in the long run. Does that make sense, everybody? I know I'm kind of hopping around on some of this stuff. Does that make sense to you, Zach? Yeah, I think what, what is really shining through is just the power and the flexibility of being able to take any process that folks are doing manually and might think that they have to do manually and just figuring out a way to plug in some of these apps, again, that you're gonna share at the end and, and possibly tweak them here and there to fit their own workflow. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really what it comes down to is a lot of when I've talked to people about um, about automation before, there's always this fear that it's going to be locked in. Uh, certain processes are going to be locked in kind of like what April was saying earlier is that, you know, I got to send different messages every single time uh, to different people. And it's you can set it up where a lot of this stuff can be automated, um, but you can still customize it as you're going along the way. Uh, I'm going to show you another one. I'm going to build this one live. I'm going to build it straight up from the ground up. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that we see, and this is where ClickFlow is going to come into play, and I love this, is that uh, one of the big challenges that we all have as content marketers or uh, as SEOs or anybody who's managing a large volume of web pages is that they need to be refreshed, right? Uh, maybe every six months, every maybe every year, they need to be refreshed and we need to revisit a lot of these pages, but we're not keeping track of these things on a regular basis, um, which means that a lot of this stuff, we end up with a lot of old outdated content, uh, which can lose rank or weigh the website down. And that's a big problem. So what I've done is I've created an automation and this is uh, something that you'll, you'll see uh, from the ground up here. And create an automation where the workflow automatically notifies you uh, when, when the piece is ready to be looked at. So 
Uh, again, we've got this whole process right here. We've got all of the different steps, ideas validated in production. I'm gonna actually copy this published view where I'm gonna duplicate it and we'll call this uh, our class here. Guys and review. Now this is why I love Airtable because I can create all sorts of number, all, all sorts of different filters around this uh, to make it so uh, these are only conditions. So uh, the conditions are the only things that show up in this view. So I'm going to add a condition here, and I'm going to create a filter where the status is published, and then the published date is before it's before a number of days ago now i like to revisit things after 90 days right and we'll see that that's there now if i were to change this date if i were to change the published date over here then it would uh not show up right if i were to change this over to like yesterday, it's going to be gone, right? So anytime that something is over 90 days old, once this once a piece is 90 days old, then it's going to show up in here. That's the first step. The next step is where we start to build this automation, right? So we'll go over here in Airtable and we'll click new automation. And this automation is, they just changed their interface, which is always fun. Um, when uh, a record enters a view, and that view in this case is the uh, on this particular public on that particular table that we were just looking at. The view is the revisit and revise. So we've started to do like if this then that sort of logic, right? When a record enters the view, uh, revisit and revise. Okay, we already know that we have a record there. Then we're going to do two things. Uh, we're going to send a Slack message to me. In this case, we'll do walk with Slack. And we'll have that message say, hey, Tommy. Hey. Say the record name here. We'll do the title. Right? The article title is what we just had before. Hey, Tommy, this particular article is over 90 days old. I can't type when people are looking. Do you have that problem, Zach? I do actually, yeah. I also don't do math in public. That's my new rule. <laughs> I just had that problem earlier today. I'm, I'm going, yeah, I don't want to look at it. Um, so, and then what we're going to say here, or actually you can revisit it here. That's what we're going to say. Of course. Now, Airtable or uh, Slack is funny with the way that they format. So uh, I like to have clean links. So we do an angle bracket. Uh, we'll then do the Airtable record URL. And then the way that Slack uh, does their links is you do the angle bracket, you do a pipe, and then you close it off there. Okay. So now every time something enters that field or en enters that view, uh, we're going to run this test. My notifications are off right now. Uh, you can see all of my Slack messages. Awesome. Now Slackbot's going to notify me uh, anytime something enters the 90 day view and says, uh, hey, Tommy, the largest, right? Here's the thing. Now it's 90 days here. I can click that. I'm brought straight to the record. And now I can start to do, you know, my thing from there. But this is ClickFlow, right? And we want to do some other stuff. We want to we want to add some stuff to that record um, that makes it a little bit easier and make it a little bit simpler. So uh, we're going to say, if you would like to check out where it sits in the 
you can check that out here. Right, again, now I'm going to go to ClickFlow. I'm going to have my content decay report, grab my link, put that in here. And now we see here, now we can access the content decay report directly from uh, Slack. And we're not having to go to this information. Now the information is coming to us, which reduces the amount of manual work we're gonna have to do to check in on all of this part of the process. That's kind of the point. We're gonna do one more thing here. Um, and we're gonna create a, another field that says, uh, report turn that field into a url right then we're going to do one more thing we're going to go back to that automation that we were just doing main thing make sure you name these uh, as you're going along it's very easy to lose track um and then we're going to add one more step right so trigger the first action is send me a slack message the second is to update the record and we're gonna go back over to that table, the all publishing properties table. We're gonna look at the record ID, just right here. And then the field is that one we just created, the flow link. So say I can't get to the, uh, the air table, or say I can't get to it right away um, because I'm, I've got stuff I'm doing and sometimes Slack just doesn't cut it for me. Um, now I can have, I can still access it directly uh, from the record and go back to it. So Tommy, just All to right. recap for folks what's going on here. So you have basically a 90 day delay after a piece is published, and then you're going to automatically pull in all this information to ping, is it the author to say, hey, here's the, the post, it's 90 days old. Let's click here to check in ClickFlow's content decay report to see if it's lost traffic and if it's due for a refresh. And I imagine folks could easily adjust this to you know six months later or even twelve months later. Yep. Yeah, you can adjust the time frame um, for anything, and you can even set rules. So to answer the first question, it doesn't necessarily have to be the author. It's anybody you want. So if I go back to this Slack message here, um, I'm just notifying myself. But if I wanted to say like Brenna or Jeff, I could have either one of them be notified. It's whoever's responsible for that part of the process. So if it's an author, sure. If it's somebody else, absolutely. Um, and it doesn't have to be a Slack message. It can be you know, an email. Uh, it can be however somebody prefers to com be communicated with, right? Um, I could send them an email and then it would go that way. And what I love um, about it is it kind of removes the, the content team lead or the SEO lead as the bottleneck, right? You can put the owner, right. the writer or whoever to say, hey, you know, as a policy, if you get this notification and you find that an older piece that you, you wrote has started to lose traffic, then please add that to, you know, the publishing queue or, or kick off whatever process to actually refresh it. And then that's all happening without your involvement. Exactly. That's beautiful. Exactly. And that's, I updated the wrong thing, the wrong field just in case somebody was wondering, hey, how come it didn't show up there? Exactly. I mean, it's it's that part where it reduces that amount of human error that can happen and the amount of things that you need to keep on top of on any given point in time in the day, right? Um, another one that's very similar to that, right? On So let's, let's take it out of the revise and review for a second. I always work with a deputy editor because I'm always like as the editor in chief, uh, as the person managing all of the content, uh, I have, you know, staying on top of the day-to-day -day stuff, it can be very difficult. Um, so I've got another automation in place. It's very similar to the one that we have here where it is, uh, let's see, which one is it? Notify Slack editor. So this basically says when a record enters that, um, that view, the for review queue, right? Then send a Slack message to, there we go then send a Slack message to um, that person. So, hey, Tommy, the article on whatever the topic is uh, for whichever blog. So if I'm running multiple properties, so if I'm doing like a blog, a knowledge base and SEO transactional pages, 
I can now tell myself uh, which property that we're managing this on is ready for me to review. I can check out the draft here and it brings me directly to the draft URL. This is going to be a, a dirty link, not a clean link, uh, unfortunately. Um, and we'll select the Slack account and then this would be uh, I mean, it can be me, the individual user, or it can be any channel that's in Slack. So say we've got a whole team of people that's supposed to be responsible for this, right? Uh, we can do that. There's another automation that I've got set up where it can randomize your editors. So you can start to load balance your queues. Does that make sense? So if you have, if you have multiple sub editors, right, you can randomize who's going to have the piece assigned to them, and then they can be notified based on uh, that randomization, right? That you can send this to any channel that you want. Um, in this case, I'm going to send it back to my account here. So anytime something ends up in review, I'm going to get a notification. Hey, Tommy, this article on blank is ready for you to review. You can check out the draft here, right? Um, so I can go directly from uh, this here, I didn't actually have a draft attached to that one, um, but I could go directly from Slack into the uh, Google Doc. So I wouldn't, I can even skip, skip that step of going into the process here. You still with me? Yep. All right. I'll give you one more example of this, um, of what can happen in here. And then I wanna open it up for Q and A. Um, we've got, so, so there, there's one common process, especially within larger orgs where you have to get sign off chains. And I'm gonna blame legal uh, for this in particular, right? Legal is always the, the, the bottleneck there. Um, and I don't think anybody here, who, who here, just show of hands, who actually likes legal? Actually, I think show of hands is probably the worst way to ask that question. <laughs> um, so we've got, uh, I've got this set up a little bit differently. Um, so, so right here, I've got a field called legal review and because it's not every single thing that needs to go into legal review and it's not, um, not everything needs to be uh, legally reviewed and it doesn't always warrant having its own view of things right here. So I don't necessarily care about having its own view. Now, if I worked for the company that did have a legal review process for every single thing, one, I wouldn't work for that company, but two, um, I would have a view here dedicated specifically to that because that would be part of our day-to-day -day workflow, right? So right here, instead of saying, let's have a view, I'm gonna tell the automation, if this particular record is checked with legal review, right? I could do one of two things. Um, I can send a digest or I can send it to them ad hoc. So I'm gonna create this automation that says, uh, the trigger type is at a scheduled time, right? And that scheduled time is gonna be uh, every week, every one week on a Monday at 9 a.m. We're gonna find a record, right? Do another action type here. That record is going to be find records that have on the all publishing properties table that have a condition. And that condition is where legal review is checked. And what will happen is, uh, okay, we found that there. The next step that we'll take is send them an email, right? So we've got another action type there, send an email to the content studio, Tommy at the content studio.com. We can then automate what the subject line is going to be and how many records there are. So they can see from the subject line, hey, there are you know five records that need your approval. We'll go down here and we'll say, here's a digest of everything that needs your approval, right? And right here, we can have the option to send it as a list or a grid. List is dirty, I don't like it. So we'll send it as a grid. And we can also specify uh, what shows up in that grid. Right, so we'll show more options. We can also CC people. We can change our from name. Uh, we can have them reply. If it's somebody that's not me, uh, if I have a liaison, um, they can reply to somebody else. We can set that there. 
I'll test it again. I'm not opening up my email here, but we can preview what that email would look like. And we can start to say like, hey, and then this is what they would see, right? They would get the, the grid of everything that needs to happen. And then from their email, they can click right here and go directly into the document and do any editing that they need to do. Cool, we've got five minutes left. Let's open so it up. Let's... Nate, do folks have questions on any of the above other topics? Feel free to drop it in the chat. Zach, was there anything while we're waiting for people to respond there? Was there anything that kind of came to mind as you were going along? Uh, well, one thing that came to mind is when you showed uh, your ClickFlow content decay report, I noticed that you didn't have any content decay. So I think that's a testament to you being great at content. If folks want to get uh, a better idea of content decay and what that report might look like, uh, especially for a bigger site that you know has been around for years where you would expect to see more decay, I'm going to drop a link to Brian Dean's review of ClickFlow on backlinko.com. And you can just scroll halfway down that page. There's a pretty good screenshot that'll give you a little bit more um, visibility into what that looks like. There we go. Perfect. I love Brian, by the way. He's so, so good at what he does. Great guy. Any questions from folks? I think that this was pretty thorough, Tommy. So if there aren't any, that, that's probably an indication that, that we covered everything pretty well. Um, folks can continue to drop questions in if you have them. Tommy, did you want to switch to the automation training that you have going on? And we can tell folks about that in these last few minutes here. Yes. So uh, give me just a moment here. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, I do have an automation 101 course that I have put together that talks about, uh, I'm in the, the pre-development uh, process for this, but what the automation course is going to be is the 101 element of this. How do you think about content automation? How do you think about workflow automation um, and the foundations and principles of that thought process. Uh, a lot of challenge does come down to how do you think about this stuff and what's possible. And that's one of the things that I very much uh, am trying to champion um, and, and giving an idea on how that works. Uh, let's see. So if you want to visit, uh, well, actually it will be, it will be in the, the follow-up here, but it's, um, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Zach contentstudio.com forward slash automation program. Uh, you'll be sent to a pre-sign up list uh, where you can learn more about that program. Awesome. And you'll be sending out more information, I think, as you beef up that program and folks can uh, you know, join if, if it looks like a good fit for them. Exactly. Great. Well, as we wrap here, anyone have any questions? Uh, you can also feel free to respond to the follow-up email that we'll be sending out with the recording. If anything comes to mind, if you want to learn more about ClickFlow, learn more about the content studio and everything that Tommy has going on. Uh, I imagine folks on this call, they might be interested in learning more about your services, Tommy. Can you, can you speak briefly about that and what, how you help companies if they want some more, some more hands-on help? Yeah. So content studio has uh, three primary arms of what we do. One of them is the content operations uh, side of the house. We also build content marketing programs from the ground up. Uh, so that includes everything from operations to budgeting and creating systems like what we're talking about here. Um, and then the third one is in our primary uh, thing that we like to start with for everybody is auditing. So we will do a content audit for folks that includes um, looking at pretty much uh, a number of the content pages that you have to dissect uh, where you are in the market and how you can write better. But we also have 106 point uh, SEO audit that we do and a data analysis. Um, we look at the data layer on everything as well. So uh, try to look at the entirety of what's happening on your website, your web presence, and how to make that better. Um, I work with folks, uh, the two primary folks that I work with on the uh, auditing side. One was a group marketing manager over at QuickBooks um, and on the SEO side, and the other is a data analyst or data scientist over there as well. So uh, very strong backgrounds. Very, very cool. As we wrap up here, Tommy, Ben did have a question. He asked earlier, you talked about the different distribution channels. How do you leverage automation to help deliver content to everywhere you need it post-publishing? Ah, that is a great question. I'm still sharing my screen, correct? Yep. So some of the automations that are in place here, uh, Airtable has this right out of the box. Um, 
where you can automatically push things to uh, uh, you can automatically push things over to LinkedIn um, or to uh, Twitter and a number of other places. And then uh, I create zaps uh, over here that can also do things like automatically update uh, in, in the different areas uh, that you need to. Um, the other thing that I try to do, uh, you can see here, I have a, I don't have it on here, but there's another table that I have on one of my other bases that has uh, LinkedIn or linked outreach. So if I find uh, opportunities on other websites where I can link, I can keep track of all of those places and then email the, um, the once I found the email for the person, uh, I can email them directly from Airtable and keep track of all the correspondence that we have uh, going from there. So um, yeah, I mean, some of the process is still gonna be manual, but a lot of the um, distribution stuff can be taken care of from a automated standpoint. Awesome. Uh, Tommy, this has been great. We are at time. So we did promise folks links to some of those pre-built zaps. We will make sure to include those in the follow-up emails along with the recording. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I hope this was helpful. Um, Tommy, once again, thank you for, for everything. And uh, we'll hope to have you on again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great one. Take care.